And I really want to focus here in my talk about why Alzheimer's disease is the disease of our time, why it's something that we're all concerned about now, and why we weren't concerned about it a few years ago. So my first question to you is how many of you were concerned about developing Alzheimer's disease in your life or a close family member, a spouse? Oh, the vast majority of people. And just in a recent article in Time Magazine, a survey of the United States population, 85% of the population was concerned about it. And only about 27% are in fact have a fa currently affected family member. But how many of you that are, let us say, old enough to remember, how many of you think you were, would have been worried about Alzheimer's disease if you thought back 30 years ago? In 1980, would you have been worried about Alzheimer's disease, even if you were current age? None of you. So how did this disease become such a scourge to us over the last 30 years? Is it because we're living longer? Yeah, that is true. We're living slightly longer than we used to, although the greatest grains, uh, gains in aging have been through reductions in infant mortality. Well, it's said, you know, that 100 years ago, the average age was 30. Actually, those people that lived to 20 easily lived to 70 or 80 years of age. But the fastest growing part of our population in the United States and Western world are those people over the age of 85, which are at extreme risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Is the disease increasing in incidence? Are there more people getting it? As I'll show in a graph uh, right after this, it appears to be increasing, but is it just really increasing or is our appreciation of the disease increasing? Are there changes in diagnosis that have happened over the last 30 years or what we expect to be when we're 80 years old? But I think why we're all concerned also is there really isn't much you can do for the disease. The disease is completely incurable. While there's therapeutics that can be given to relieve patients of some symptoms, their effect is really quite small. Not only is it incurable, it has a tremendous drain on families. Currently, in the United States, over 10 million people are involved in the care of family members. Uncompensated care in most cases, of uh, care of family members that are suffering from Alzheimer's disease, of which there are now around 5 million. It's estimated to be about $180 billion spent on care, and likely to increase as time goes on, as the baby boomers are just now entering the high-risk phase of developing Alzheimer's disease. And why, speaking to the Mind Science Institute, I think one of the biggest concerns is that Alzheimer's disease comes on us like a thief, stealing our consciousness, our identity. The individuals, through the course of the disease, will lose all aspects of their higher cognition and memory and will be, at least in the initial phase, physically, their body will be in quite good shape. Um, if we look at diseases that are the scourge of the, uh, the United States population right now, we see that most of them actually as a cause of death are decreasing. Heart disease, stroke, prostate cancer are all decreasing over the last few years. But Alzheimer's disease over just that same period has increased as a cause of death by around 50%. Is it really been increasing 50% or is it our appreciation of that's changed? Further, it's important to note that Alzheimer's disease doesn't directly kill a person. What happens is the debilitation in the bedridden state usually lead to pneumonia or other sequelae that lead to death. When I mention the fastest growing population for the United States, isn't just those that are making it to 60s and 70s, which would have been common in the past. It's those people over 85 years of age, which are very often physically very, very fit, but are very susceptible to having Alzheimer's disease. Right now, estimates and population-based studies, such as this one that was done in New York City, is that 
over half the population can suffer from dementia of Alzheimer's disease. And there's quite a lot of variation depending on ethnic or socioeconomic status, such as in this study, which shows that Hispanics uh, over the age 85, over 60% suffer from Alzheimer's disease, as where the white population only around 30%. And this probably relates to important lifestyle aspects, type 2 diabetes or other changes of um, diet and mental activity and physical activity play important roles in how one develops the disease. But what brought about the major change for why Alzheimer's disease is now a scourge is related to how Alzheimer's disease was appreciated by the, by the public. Alzheimer's disease has been with us historically. It's mentioned in Shakespeare's plays, King Lear, is probably demented from Alzheimer's disease, as well you, as you can find many other historical figures mentioned through the literature. But they're sporadic, not common. And it wasn't a surprise that the first person described with Alzheimer's disease, August D., August Dieter, in the early 1900s, was an individual that was middle-aged, a woman in her 50s, who developed major cognitive loss and began to be paranoid and jealous of her husband and he had her institutionalized. And, uh, and when she was institutionalized, she was studied by Dr. Alice Alzheimer, who documented her changes clinically and when she died, he analyzed her brain with newly, newly developed silver stains, which were able to spot the pathology of the disease. So that's the first description of the disease. But unfortunately, by being of a middle-aged woman in her 50s, you were dealing with an extremely rare condition. And while it had a lot of consequence for August D, if you were dealing with something that was extremely rare, it just joined the large pantheon of neurological diseases which don't have a treatment and affect small number of patients. And it wasn't until 1970, in the pivotal studies from England, from Thomas and Blessed and Roth, in which they did a studies of people who were institutionalized and looked at those that were demented and those that were not, and looked what types of changes occurred in their brain. And they documented the people that were old and had dementia had the same changes described in August D. So Alzheimer's disease now became a disease of the aged, a common disease. Even from Alzheimer's time, it was known to be a disease that has profound changes in the brain. In this particular case, I'm showing a comparison of a healthy brain. The brain fills the cranium, the skull cavity where the brain is located, and it fills it all with gray and white matter, such as on the left. Somebody with Alzheimer's disease, in advanced cases, the brain shrinks. The skull doesn't shrink, so that it gets filled with fluid cavities both within it and outside of it, and it can shrink up to 30 or 40 percent. Some regions of the brain, such as the hippocampus and the lower part of this figure, the seahorse-shaped structure, can shrink up to 90 percent, and that's the part of the brain that's important in, in memory function. So it's why people with Alzheimer's disease, the most constant change is loss in memory. The changes that occur in the brain are very striking. In the upper panels, the upper two panels, I show the type of stain that Ellis Alzheimer would have used, the silver stains, which were invented just a few years before he did his pivotal study. And below, we deal with um, immunostains, which were invented about 20 or 30 years ago. All of these show the lesions of Alzheimer's disease, the plaques and tangles that you hear all about as being the cause of the disease, and there are profound changes that occur in the brain. The main therapeutic inroad that people have taken to under, both to understand the disease, the basic biology of the disease, as well as how to treat patients, has been to remove these lesions of the brain, the plaques and the tangles. And so they have been the focus for over 100 years to understanding the disease. And what's really been striking in the last few months even is that this approach has completely failed as a therapeutic inroad. In the most recent failure, 
Eli Lilly halted a phase three trial called the Identity Trial involving thousands of patients taking an inhibitor to amyloid formation because the patients actually got worse. They became more demented. And this has been paralleled by studies over the past decade in which the amyloid vaccine has been given to patients. Amyloid has been lowered in the brain by imaging studies. But in fact, there's been no clinical benefit from the patients. Some of them actually have gotten worse. Many have remained about the same. And this has led to the idea on our part and others that maybe these pathological changes that are occurring in the brain may be important responses to the brain, to the aging process. Because we know that amyloid forms during brain trauma um, it's present in fighters, it's present in um, NFL football players after head trauma, and that maybe there's a different effect from the amyloid. So we've examined people's brains as well as proteins taken from the brain to look at their effect um, on one of the major changes of Alzheimer's disease, one of the most detrimental aspects, oxidative stress. It's why you take vitamin E and vitamin C and you eat a diet rich in vegetables and fruits and has been linked to um, greater health benefits. Well, in Alzheimer's disease, there's a major increase in oxidative damage. And that oxidative damage increase is met by increased amyloid deposition and actually decreases. So instead of the amyloid causing oxidative damage, it actually reduces it. And that's shown on the left. And on the right, what we actually examined was the mechanism for that decrease. What we, what we found was that if we looked at oxidation, which is the damaging effect of the disease, and we added um, amyloid beta to an inducer of the oxidative stress, copper, and don't go out and change your copper pipes in your house, nor your aluminum pans. It isn't just a matter of copper or aluminum or iron in your diet that causes this. It's about how they're organized. Uh, with the proteins that are in the brain, but the amyloid binds to copper and actually removes it from being redox active. In other words, it suppresses, much like the body does with iron through ferritin and other storage proteins. And, and instead of viewing the changes of the pathology of the disease as being a detrimental aspect of it, they may be important responses that protect individuals, much like a lot of other changes of aging may be. It may be good to have white hair or wrinkled skin. We just don't really understand the biology and how they fit in. So with this idea in mind, we went back and examined the brain to look whether there were changes that are part of the aging process and well-established parts of the aging process that may be linked to the basic biology of aging. In that case, we looked at mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouse organelle that's important in taking food stuff and turning it into the energy that you use. The brain is highly dependent on high levels of energy. It consumes 25% of the, your food that you eat each day, and is, yet it's only 2% of your mass. So what we found was that in Alzheimer's disease, the mitochondria are present in remnants and the neurons. And that's shown by these gold nanoparticles on the left you can find mitochondrial garbage in cells that you don't find in normal individuals. And this links our findings very closely to the aging phenomenon uh, from a finding that was just reported in San Antonio. That is that the drug rampamycin, which has an important um, role in organ and um, transplant biology, also plays an important role in modulating this pathway of removing garbage from cells. And when it's been given to animals, it extends their life by 30 to 40 percent. So the same process that's controlling the lifespan of mice, humans, other animals is important and altered during Alzheimer's disease involving mitochondria. And these changes in energetics actually predate the disease. It's been known that people that are genetically at risk of having Alzheimer's disease have energetic problems 20 to 30 years before they develop the disease. So trying to end on a hopeful note that uh, there are 100 simple things you can do to, to reduce your risk of having Alzheimer's disease, to have a longer life that's uh, 
healthy with healthy cognition. But I think in order to go beyond that, and all of those studies show that by changing lifestyle, you can reduce Alzheimer's disease by about a half. But you can't completely stop it. You can just lower your risk. I think to be able to do beyond that, we have to understand the biology of aging more clearly. Rampamycin has enough side effects that it's not going to be the therapeutic for Alzheimer's disease. But pathways like this, understanding mitochondrial metabolism or um, the important role of antioxidants in the body are going to have therapeutic value. Further, I think for understanding the treatment of aging diseases in general, it's important to understand for diseases that occur in healthy individuals, remember half the people will develop Alzheimer's disease if they live into their 80s, that the changes are part of the normal responses of the body and may not be things you want to remove. And again, I emphasize lifestyle modification is what you can do now, that you can have a longer, healthier life with it. You can um, play a role in being informed and mentally active, and all of those will have some benefit for you. Thank you very much for the attention.